Hi folks, HR Funk here. The idea for this video came about as a result of two training sessions that I went to last week. The first was firearm simulator training. Now for any of you who are unacquainted with firearm simulator training, imagine a very large video game. The system we used for the training session that I attended was very sophisticated. In fact, I think it was the best one that I've used. Now I've spent many, many hours both undergoing and conducting firearm simulator training, but it's always good to go back and keep yourself sharp by reviewing that training or renewing that training periodically. When someone's undergoing the training, they are standing in front of a large screen, and the screen is connected to a computer through some sort of technological hocus pocus, and there are images or scenarios projected onto the screen for the person undergoing training to react to. And during those video scenarios, there may be lethal threats that present themselves and the person undergoing training has to react to those threats, both verbally or if necessary by resorting to the proper response option, which may or may not be their firearm. With the system we were using, as I said, it was set up on an indoor range, and if you had to fire, the screen somehow was able to sense where the bullets hit, and the on-screen images would react to those shots. If a shooter fired a shot that struck a vital area of the target, the on-screen bad guy would react to that and become incapacitated and fall down and cease to be a threat. If the shot registered was a non-lethal area, an arm, a leg, or what have you, the bad guy image might react to that, he or she might go down, but then they might continue firing, or maybe if it was a hit in the arm, they might turn and run away, or what have you. Or if there was a clean miss, then the bad guy would continue with whatever kind of mayhem caused you to shoot at him or her in the first place. So again, very, very good training, and I very much enjoyed it. And as I said, that was a very sophisticated system we were using, and I liked it a lot. The second training session that I went to was not firearms training per se, but it was being conducted by a gentleman who has 20 plus years in Army Special Forces. And during the course of that training, sooner or later we got around to talking about shooting, and he started to say that in recent times he has gone with pistols from using his sights when he's shooting at a bad guy. By the way, this gentleman has, I believe, 18 combat deployments, so when he talks about shooting at a bad guy, he has really shot at lots of bad guys. In any case, he said that with handguns he has gone to focusing on the target when he's shooting and not focusing on the sights. And as he was talking, two things occurred to me. First off, it occurred to me what he was describing essentially is what for a long time we've called point shooting, meaning you're focusing on the target and squeezing off the shots as you're pointing and firing toward the target without consciously trying to line up the sights and squeeze off the most accurate shots you can. This is something that has been around for a long time. It's not a new concept, but the other thing that occurred to me while he was talking is back during that firearm simulator training, there were a lot of scenarios where I was doing exactly that. And during the course of that firearm simulator training, I think I had six or eight different scenarios that I went through. But I wasn't doing that exclusively. Basically, when there were times that I was in close and they were very fast moving scenarios, I was coming up, focusing on the target and firing shots. But as the distance increased, I know there were times that I very definitely was concentrating on my sights. The one that stands out in my mind is there was a scenario, this was the classic hostage situation where the bad guy has the hostage around the neck and has a, a pistol to, it was a, a female hostage, has a pistol to her head, and he's you know yelling and doing this and doing that. And he finally gave me just enough of an exposure that I was able to fire a shot. And I remember very specifically concentrating on that sight picture and squeezing off a good shot. And I hit the bad guy dead center. He fell down. The hostage was saved. Now, had this been a TV show, we would have cut to the next scene where the hostage, the former hostage, would have now been my girlfriend. We'd have been in a sports car and riding off into the sunset. The video scenarios never seem to go to that point, And I think that's a defect that the companies who build those systems should address because it really needs to get to that point. But I digress. So I started thinking about point shooting and what I was doing in those different videos. And I know there were other scenarios where the distance, or at least what appeared to be the distance, again, this is on a, a video screen, but the distance appeared to be greater. And I know I very definitely was concentrating on my sights as I was shooting. 
but it was not a conscious thought. I wasn't thinking during the scenario, okay, I'm really close so I can point shoot up, oh, geez, I'm farther away, so I've got to concentrate on my sights and get at least a flash sight picture, or this is a greater distance, or it's a really precise shot, so now I really have to make sure that I'm watching those sights. It was all very instinctive. Now, as I said, I've done lots and lots and lots and lots of that kind of training, and I've done other sorts of training that also reinforce those things. But I started to wonder, at what distance does point shooting, or target focus if you will, start to lose precision to the point that it's really not effective, or at least not advisable? Now, I realize this can be different from individual to individual. Some people might be able to point shoot a lot farther or to a lot greater distance than some other shooters might be able to. But I still wanted to take a look at this, and I don't think I've ever done this before on or off camera, and tried to look at just how far away I can move from a target and still be able to get effective hits on the target by using point shooting. And that's what I'm gonna look at in this video. So after I decided I wanted to explore this subject, I had to decide how to go about it. And it seemed to me that if I used just one firearm, in this case, one handgun, that I wasn't really exploring it to the degree that I wanted to. So what I decided was I'm going to use three different handguns to represent three different types of pointing characteristics for me. One of them is going to be my Smith & Wesson M&P 2.0 9mm. This one is one that points very, very naturally for me. This just feels like the grip was more or less made for my hand. I've been using the M&Ps for a long, long time, and they very instinctively come up and stay pointed on the target for me. But I also wanted to use something that didn't point as well for me. And if you saw my last video on the Steyr M9A2MF, this is going to look very familiar to you. And the reason I wanted to use this pistol is because this one has the Glock grip angle that doesn't point real naturally for me. It always has a tendency to point kind of high, and I have to compensate for it when I come up on target. So I thought this would be, give me a good idea of my parameters, and also it'll help explore whether or not that natural pointing characteristic really does transfer over to instinctive point shooting. And I also, wanted to add a revolver into the mix. Revolvers have very different pointing characteristics because of their configuration and their grip contour and angle and what have you. So I wanted to throw a revolver in to see if there's any significant difference we can see as we move farther and farther from the target and we are point shooting with regard to how the point of impact occurs with the revolvers. So that was the way I decided to do it, and I, I had to limit myself to three. At one point, I had it in my mind I might have five or six out there and have some 1911s and some other things. So I really had to pare this down to just three. So one that points very naturally for me, one that doesn't point as naturally for me, and a revolver that I think revolvers point pretty well for me, but again, they're just different than the semi-autos. Next, I had to come up with a methodology for actually conducting the test. And what I decided to do was to use a Q target. And I like these because the proportions are pretty good. They're not outrageously big like some targets that we see used for qualification or what have you. And this one has the anatomical structures that I like. So as I shoot at this target, what I'm going to do from various distances. I'm going to start out at two yards and then move to three yards and then five yards with each of the three pistols. And I'm going to start in a low ready position and I'll have my timer with me. And on the signal to fire, I'm going to fire three shots into the body of the target in a time limit of three seconds. Now I'm not necessarily going to take three seconds to fire all three shots, but the time limit is going to be three seconds. So I'm not taking all day looking around and trying to adjust my hold and everything else. I'm just going to come up and fire the shots about as fast as I think I can more or less keep them on target and maintain some sort of an actual defensive tempo to the shooting. So start in low ready position. On the signal to fire, I'm going to come up and just fire three shots with each one of my three handguns. And I'm going to rotate them from each distance. So I'll start out 
and shoot them in one order at the first distance of two yards. Then when I get to three yards, I'll shoot them in a different order and so forth and so on as I move back. So I'm not always shooting one of them the first time, one of them the second time, and the other one the third time. Because it could be a situation where when I get to the third time, just from some sort of muscle memory or what have you, of always shooting them in the same order, I'm giving some advantage or some disadvantage to a specific one of these handguns. So again, I'm going to shoot them in random order, and when I shoot them at the target as I start moving back, I'm going to say anything that stays inside the silhouette is a good shot. Anything that hits off the target, if any one shot is completely off the silhouette, that's the distance where that particular handgun is going to be out of the competition. Now what I'll do when that happens is I will stop and then I'll go back and shoot with what's called a flash sight picture. This was, if it was not developed by Colonel Jeff Cooper, it was certainly popularized by him. And the idea with a flash sight picture is you are coming up and just seeing enough of the sights to get a reference with where the pistol is in regard to the target and seeing the sights superimposed on the target and then beginning your trigger press. This is normally the way I shoot. I don't normally point shoot when I'm coming up for defensive shooting. I normally get some sort of a flash sight picture and some sort of a reference before I start my trigger press. But as I said, when I was doing that firearm simulator training, I know that in the very close scenarios, I wasn't doing that. I was coming up, focusing on the target and just shooting. So I want to see where or at what distance I'm going to start to lose accuracy with each of these three pistols. And then I'm going to shoot it using a flash sight picture from that distance to see what the difference is in the time to put three accurate shots on target. And then we'll move on and see which firearm lasts the longest or goes to the greatest distance before I start to have a miss. And when we get all done, we'll compare the results with all three of these handguns and see what kind of conclusions we can draw. So with all of that groundwork explanation out of the way, let's head out to the range and start this test. Again, when I start each stage, I'm going to be coming up on the signal to fire and focusing solely on the target and squeezing off the shots, just pointing the pistol at the target and seeing where the shots hit. I'm not going to use a flash sight picture until I have a miss with each individual handgun. Then I'll stop and go back and fire that stage using the flash sight picture just to see how much difference there is. And here we go, folks. I'm going to start things off from a distance of two yards with the M&P. We'll see how it does. Then I'll switch over to the other two pistols, and then we'll just keep on moving back and see where I start to see those shots wander as I'm using the point shooting. Then I'll transition over to the flash sight picture. And not surprisingly, none of those three handguns had any problem with the point shooting from two yards. Now I'm going to move to three yards and we'll try it from there. I'm going to have the same drill, three shots in three seconds, but I'm not necessarily going to take all three seconds to shoot them. I'll keep track of what the time actually is to get my three shots on target. And this time around, I'll start things out with the Steyr. And no issues once again with any of our pistols from a distance of three yards. Now I'm going to move back to five yards and we'll see what happens there. 
and this time I'll start things off with the Model 66. And all three of our contestants made it past the five yard stage. One thing I am seeing though, and it's most noticeable with the Model 66, is a tendency to hit low on the target. And I think what's happening is since I'm looking over top of the pistol at the target, I'm not raising it physically as high as I normally do, and that's accounting for that tendency to hit low. I notice it mostly with the Model 66, but also with the M&P. Now, interestingly, the Steyr normally points high when I present it to the target, and we saw from those three shots that I fired from the Steyr, they were actually all right around the heart. They didn't hit low. So that might be a situation where that tendency to hit high, if I'm focusing on the target rather than on the sights, is going to be a benefit rather than a detriment. So on we go to the seven yard line and I'll start things off this time with the M&P. Just a quick point before I go on, we're again seeing that tendency for the Model 66 to continue hitting low, but two out of those three are 357s aimed at the spine. I don't think I would have wanted to be this guy. Oh, and the Steyr is the first one to throw a shot from seven yards. I've got one shot out there that went over the left shoulder. So as we've seen and in the last stage, I mentioned that with the Steyr shooting a little bit high, it might've been helping to keep those shots from going low. Here we see where a shot went high, but not only just high off to the right. So the limit for the Steyr is going to be less than seven yards, at least for me with my experience with this pistol at this time. At five yards, it still felt pretty good, but moving back to seven yards, I'm starting to throw shots. So now I'm going to reshoot this stage using a flash sight picture, and we'll see how much difference there is when I shoot that way. One point forty one seconds, so it was about two tenths of a second slower using the flash sight picture, but I have three good shots on the target. And on we go to nine yards, and we've still got the M&P and the Model 66 in the competition. Let's see how they do from here. And the Model 66 came close to leaving us at that distance of nine yards, but this shot is still completely inside the white area of the target. It didn't break the line, so the Model 66 is going to continue on to the next stage. And the M&P managed to stay in the competition from nine yards as well, but as you can see, things are starting to get really iffy at that distance. When I move back to the next stage, I won't be surprised if one or even both pistols don't make it through that one. 
And on we go. The next stage is going to be from 10 yards or 30 feet. Let's see how things go from there. And sadly, the Model 66 is going to leave us from that distance of 10 yards. I've got one shot out of the three that's just off the white silhouette here. So now I'll try three shots with a flash sight picture from that distance of 30 feet, and we'll see what the difference is in the time and what the difference is in the accuracy and point of impact. Two point fifty five seconds, two point fifty five seconds, so still well under the time limit that I established of three seconds for those three shots, and I've got three very good chest hits on the target. Folks, the MP is still in play, so now I'm going to move back to a distance of twelve yards, and from there I'm gonna try three shots, point shooting, focusing on the target, and we'll see how it does from there. <laughs> and 36 feet is going to be just too far for the M&P. That was 1.87 seconds, two shots are on the target, but one shot went off to the side. So the limit for the M&P is going to be 10 yards for point shooting. And here's three shots with the M&P from that distance of 12 yards using a flash sight picture. Two point eighty three seconds, two point eight three seconds from that distance of twelve yards, and I've got three good shots right across the chest. And in an odd way, I'm actually glad the MP ended at the twelve yard line because as soon as I finished recording that segment, the battery of my camera died. So <laughs> that's why we're back in the shop now to talk about the results of this test and see if we learned anything from all of it. First off, I'll say that with any of these handguns, regardless of their exact configuration, at the close-in distances, there was no issue whatsoever with point shooting. The two yards, three yards, five yards, and five yards is getting back to what I would call across the room distance. As I'm standing here, the camera in front of me is probably only about three yards away. The wall behind that is probably another yard, so four yards. So if I was shooting just across this room, then that would certainly be within that five yard distance. And I think a lot of defensive shooting encounters take place at that kind of a distance. Now again, I have to stress that was me shooting. There might be other individuals that either are going to have difficulty with point shooting at that distance, or they might be able to point shoot much farther than I did. So I would encourage you to go out and do some of this shooting on your own and kind of find your own limits. I was really doing this partly to explore my own limits with point shooting to again see how far away I could move from the target before I started to lose enough precision that it became a concern. Another interesting result of this test is the fact that the Steyr M9A2MF was the first pistol to be dropped from the competition. I really expected it was going to be the Model 66 because of its longer, heavier, double-action trigger pull. I thought I was probably going to drop a shot with that before I did with one of the semi-autos. But I think this just reinforces how different that grip angle with the Steyr and with the Glock is and how much influence that has on defensive shooting. It's not just a myth, it's not just something that people don't like the feel of something. I think it's safe to say that it really does have an impact on someone's ability to shoot accurately, particularly at speed. I don't think that is something that cannot be overcome. I think if I shoot this pistol enough and I work with it enough that it's going to become very natural for me to shoot and I will probably point shoot it about as well as I do anything else. But it's going to take a lot more shooting to be able to accomplish that because it is so much different for me. 
the fact that the shot that I missed with the Steyr went high, it also went to the left, or, excuse me, it went to the right, but the fact that it went high is in keeping with the fact that when I present this pistol, it always ends up pointing high and I always have to correct with it. So again, I am a little surprised that this was the first one to be dropped from the competition, but I'm not surprised that it was dropped as a result of a shot going high. Next, how about the Model 66, folks? Hanging right in there to take second place. As I said a moment ago, I expected this was going to be the first one dropped from the competition, and I was firing full power 357 Magnum ammunition. In fact, here's the box. This is Fiocchi 142 grain full metal jacket truncated cone ammunition. Now, from the feel of it, I don't think this was extremely powerful 357 Magnum ammunition, but it is rated as 357 Magnum. And the Model 66 hung right in there. So some of this might have to do with as much revolver shooting as I've done over the years. And I didn't start out with revolvers. I started out with 1911 pistol back in the Marine Corps. But I've done a lot of shooting with these wheel guns. And I was really impressed that the Model 66 came in second place. And it did pretty well. I was hitting low. And again, I think that's because as I was presenting to the target, I was looking over top of the revolver and focusing at the target and the revolver was just physically lower, so we were seeing those shots going down into the lower abdomen area. Even so, the Model 66 did pretty well. I went back to, I believe, 10 yards with the Model 66, so not bad at all for our wheel gun. And last we have the M&P. And I can't say that I'm surprised that this was the winner, because as I said back at the beginning of the video, this pistol points very, very naturally for me. It's not a surprise that the M&P uses the same exact grip angle. Now, it's a different contour and different thickness, but the same grip angle as the 1911 pistol. So that's what I grew up on. That's what I've spent a lot of time shooting. I've spent a lot of time shooting M&Ps, and they point very, very naturally for me. So again, I'm not surprised that this pistol made it to the greatest distance before I finally had a miss. And I was at 30... So at 12 yards, I believe, is where I finally had a miss with this one. So 36 feet. I've seen shooters struggle making sighted shots from 30 feet, and even closer than that, actually. And I was able to point shoot from that distance of 30 feet and still keep shots. Now, they weren't pretty shots, but they were staying inside of the silhouette of the Q target. So there you have it, folks. That's my video on point shooting. And if you're interested in this, I would encourage you to go out and try this yourself with your own defensive pistols and just find out what your own limits are for this type of a thing. I think that knowledge goes a long way in helping instill confidence and helping you to know where you need to transition to other types of shooting. Also, if you like this video and you'd like to see me redo the test maybe with compact handguns or maybe even with rifles or something like that, let me know because it was kind of fun. I wouldn't mind going back out and making another video like this. Other than that, if you have any questions or comments about this video, as always, make sure you forward those to me. Remember, if you purchase anything from Optics Planet, be sure to use my discount code, which is... And if you use that discount code, it's good for 5% off anything you purchase from Optics Planet. Also remember, WarbirdBunker.com is making t-shirts for the channel. If you go to WarbirdBunker.com, you can see my t-shirt there, and also the other patriotic and firearm-themed t-shirts that Nathan has. They are all 100% American made and 100% cotton. So until next time, folks, from whatever distance and with whatever firearm platform you decide to use, good shooting. Bye-bye.